Good morning. It's a really good time to be in the house of the Lord. Just, we are blessed today. Let us dive into the word. Let's go up to the Lord in prayer. And let's dive into the word this morning. Let us pray. Lord, I am so thankful for you today. I am thankful for you for all that you've done for us, Lord, how you've blessed us, Lord, how we are able to look to you and know the amazing things you've done, Lord, how you are pouring out and wanting to be with your children every day. Lord, it is a blessing to know who you are, and Lord, how you've changed my life for the better. And I ask you today, Lord, as we are here approaching your word, Lord, as we come here, Lord, to know more about you, Lord, to let us not walk in and Lord, let us not leave the same way that we came in. But Lord, let us be ever changed every moment by you. And God, I ask you in this moment, let us be conscious of you. Let's look to you, Lord. Lord, hear your word. And Lord, I thank you. In terms of this holy and precious name we pray. Amen. If you'd like to turn with me to the book of Luke chapter 18, Luke chapter 18, I haven't got to look at these just yet, and by golly, <laughs> somebody just made fun of me for, for saying by golly, I tell you, I heard that. Y'all, you have no idea, this is amazing, church, we're, we're spreading the gospel, you, you guys excited today? You guys excited about that? Oh, I'm excited. See, the thing, the amazing thing is, is what when we get to see how the Lord works through us, especially as a church, when we look at mission-minded things, when we look at how God is working through us, I am so blessed to see that we have a church dedicated to the worship of the Lord the Almighty and to His mission. So I am blessed to be a part and to be your pastor. So please know that I have truly enjoyed being here. I had a buddy of mine, got to know him uh, through my, my dad, actually. My dad used to do these things called Emmaus Walks. I don't know if you guys ever heard of Emmaus Walks. Uh, very close to like the Tres Dies ministry that's up this way a little bit more. But it's a time, it's a retreat where they kind of come into a church and for 24 hours to 48 hours, they're worshiping, learning, and doing their best to get closer and closer to God. And during the time, they have this kind of testimony sharing and my dad met this gentleman who got, I got to hear his story and actually talk with the man where he was talking about how he was so called into the ministry and he was so on fire for the Lord and he knew God had called him to the big pulpit. You guys know the, the big pulpit, right? You guys know what I'm talking about? Like the really, really big one that looks like, like a borderline desk that's just really tall that every pastor wants but none of us want to admit about it. <laughs> yeah, we just, just somewhere. I got this one. I brought this from home. So... Uh, <laughs> But I always love the, this, his mentality. He was like, yes, God's called me to the ministry. I'm really on fire for what I'm ready to do. And so what does he do? He goes off to college. He gets his Bible degree. He goes off to seminary. He gets his master's in divinity, which just means he read a lot of books for a very long time. And comes out of the ministry, and he's like, man, yeah, I know God's calling me to the pulpit. I'm excited. He's going to call me in the ministry. He's going to give me a place to be, and I'm ready to go. And so as he's waiting for God's calling, one of his buddies calls him up and says, hey, I know you just got out of seminary. I have a place for you. We, we have this ministry we'd love for you to come be a part of. And so we would love for you to come down here and come check it out. So he drives. It's about an eight-hour drive to get to this place. He goes to the hotel. The next morning he gets up to go to the, to the ministry center. And what does he do? He gets up and he puts on his three-piece suit. You know, he got the slacks, got his vest, got his jacket, got the really nice tie. Oh, praise God. You know, just... Oh, you, you look sharp today, I want you to know. <laughs> but he, he gets really dressed up, and he's, he's ready to go to the, to the center. And he's driving out there, and he's following his Google Maps to get there, because if you're like me, you don't know how to drive anywhere. And he gets out to the place, and he looks up and goes, okay, this can't be right. He's down in the industrial part of town, down in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Really rough area which if you've been to Chattanooga, you know. You go down there, and it's scary. And he's driving up. He's seen homeless person after homeless person after homeless person strode across the streets. And as he gets to the center, 
he looks up and he realizes the address that is stopping him at a homeless kitchen, homeless shelter. He gets up and he's like, okay, this can't be right. This must be an outreach of the church. So maybe they just wanted to meet here and show me the ministry. He comes walking in, you know, ready to, you know, think he's going to give a devotion or something. And he sees his, his friend in really, really raggedy jeans and a work t-shirt that has stains all over it. Who's been sweating, who's been pouring his heart out because it is a soup kitchen and he's trying to serve as many people as they possibly can. One thing about Chattanooga is Chattanooga has a huge homeless issue. One of the biggest things about that, like, you can't go downtown Chattanooga without finding somebody who's homeless. And this mission was a homeless kitchen, a homeless shelter, trying to feed and give the gospel out as much as they possibly could. And so his friend meets him at the door and goes, oh, well, you're a little overdressed. Well, thank you for coming down. If you're ready to jump in, we'll go ahead and get you started. And the guy was like, oh, well, cool. What do you need me to do? Do you need me to go over here and preach? Am I going to go out here and go street witnessing? What do you need me to do? And he hands him a bucket and a toilet scrubber, scrubber and says, hey, if you don't mind, the bathrooms could really look use some cleaning. My friend looked at me and was like, you know, I'd... I'd Every ounce of me wanted to believe. He's like, because God called me to go preach behind the big pulpit. I was supposed to be preaching to thousands and thousands of people. That's where I was called to be. And that's where I was longing to be. And here I am going to clean toilets. And so he begrudgingly walks in. And he's just scrubbing the toilets down. He gets them done. And his suit's ruined from all the work that he did. Left. The next day. He woke up that morning. He's like, okay, I'm going to go in here. I'm going to tell my friend I'm done. I can't keep doing this. This is not what I'm called to do. This is not where I'm supposed to be at. God had big plans for me. And he walks in. He starts having a conversation with his friend. He's like, hey, I, this is not the ministry I thought I was going to be in. This is not the plans that I had. God's calling me to the pulpit, and that's where I should go. And his buddy looked at him and was like, well, here. Before you go, stop and think about it this way. When you're scrubbing toilets, imagine yourself cleaning the throne of God. Because God said, you know, whatever you do for the least of these, you do for me. And my body just stopped and it hit home. And it shook him and he just, it, it humbled him knowing that, hey, ministry is not all what we thought it was supposed to be like. Ministry is not preaching 100% of the time. This is just a portion of what we do. Ministry is a call to service and a call to act. But the man was humbled greatly. Serving the kingdom of God is a very humbling thing. You get to meet people, you get to see things, you get to go places, and you get to talk with people who have great testimonies. Talk with people who've done amazing things. And it can really put you back on your knees in prayer. It puts you back to where you think you're supposed to be. So I'm very glad I work with some of the most humble people that I've ever met coming here. People who have devoted their lives to serving the kingdom. People who are down to earth and realize their place in Christ and know where they need to grow and become stronger. Because I'll tell you this, forgiveness, here's the, if I'm going to give you guys, here's your point for the day, here's your impact, here's what you're going to take home with you, you guys ready for it? You prepared, are you guys awake? Did you guys get enough coffee? There's plenty in the back, hopefully. I still haven't had my cup yet, so please save me one. <laughs> There's going to be a cup back there with a label on it, Pastor Wayne, no. But if I give you your point to take home with you, if I can give this to you uh, today for you to walk away, is forgiveness is found through humility, not arrogance. Humility, uh, forgiveness is found through humility, not arrogance. Church, one of the things that we have, with, especially in the big, big C church, I'm not just talking to Kyron, I'm talking to every single one of us who claim the name Christ, who pick up the banner, who carry the cross, and say, hey, I'm picking this up daily and following after God. One of the biggest things that we struggle with as Christians is arrogance. With, is arrogance. I've had many times where you get on social media, and you find these people who are live streaming and says, like, hey, hey, guys, we're going to come here and talk back and forth, and we're going to discuss Jesus, but the entire time all they're doing is berating everybody who asks questions. All that they do is berate them for asking questions. All they do is turn them down, pour them, and just 
dig the hole and kick them in and bury them quickly. Because their arrogance is showing. We become so arrogant with what we do that there's Christians out here that are known more for what they're against than what they're for. Church, let me say that again. Are are you known more for what you're against than what you're for? Oh, we hate this group. We hate these people. We hate this. We hate that. We hate this, 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 that. Yeah, but where's the love of Christ in that? Because you've yet to mention Jesus this whole time. We become so arrogant because we believe that, hey, I'm God's chosen people. We're holy and beloved. And God has called us in Colossians. We're, we're a special people. I'm his royal priesthood. A peculiar people is actually what he calls us. Because we're weird. Which if you never met a weird Christian, then look again. But because we feel so high and mighty, God has picked us. He's handcrafted us. We're the chosen ones that we have the right to be arrogant about it. That you don't have to believe the way I do because you're free to be wrong. (laughs) Can you imagine? Although a joke, right, is actually an attitude that we find a lot among Christians. I've been a lot of places. Been a lot of churches. Seen a lot of people. I have way too many Facebook friends. And the one thing I've noticed is the arrogance among believers. And it crushes me. Because if we were looking to Scripture, all the times we'd align ourselves more with the Pharisees than we would with Christ. Our arrogance aligns us more with the Pharisees than it does with Christ. And it crushes me to know that. I don't know if you guys remember to wear your steel toe boots today, but I'm going to tell you this, I'm coming for you. So, you ready? All right. Because verse 9, I think, in this passage, really describes the heart. Because one of the things that Luke likes to do whenever he goes into parables is he likes to go ahead and give us the target audience right off the bat. He likes to tell us who he's talking, who Christ is talking about in the parable. And I love that because Luke makes it so easy for us to be like, oh, that's who Jesus is talking to. So verse 9 in chapter 18, read with me. He says this. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Who trusted in themselves and their own righteousness and treated others with contempt. Guys, I don't know if you've read your Bible, but there's a passage in that I hold very near and dear to my heart. Is that my righteousness is like what? Filthy rags. Don't worry, I'm not just talking to you guys today. There's just, I like to walk around, so it's going to be great. I've been getting, I'm practicing the lap, you know, one day. But our righteousness is like filthy rags. So why are we trusted in something that's like filthy rags? But Luke is looking at it and saying, hey, God's talking not just to Pharisees here. He's talking to people who are trusted in himself, trusted in themselves and their goodness. Because look at us, I am pious and wonderful. And how dare you not be like me? How dare you not be like me? Thank God you're nothing like me. Because it would be really boring. If everybody was like me, if everybody talked like me, that's why I came up north. None of y'all have my accent, except for a couple of y'all. So it's okay. But to know, this is the people that this parable is written to, those who find themselves righteous and hold others in contempt. And see, the thing is, we're going to look at a parable that tackles this wholeheartedly. I would rather jump into the parable and continue on with that and show you guys what God really sees here because I want to show you this imagery of the Pharisee and the tax collector as they both walk into the temple. The Pharisee and the tax collector as they come walking into church. The Pharisee, the righteous man, the one who has been in the temple, who knows the word like the back of his hand. Oh, that's new. But goes through his entire life doing great and amazing things, right? Thinking, hey, look at me. I follow God with every step of the way. Whenever God steps, I'm right behind him. And then the tax collector 
which I know I've been harping on tax collectors often, I'm sorry. But a traitor, a thief, someone seen as low as dogs. If we were in the mob, we'd go, ah, you filthy rat. We see these two people that can, contrary to what I thought, we think we go after the Pharisee, but what happens really? Let's dive into the word today. We're going to read verses 10 through 12 of chapter 18. Read with me, please. And here's the one thing I always say, read with me. Please bring your Bible to church. Open up the app on your phone. If you don't have one, there's one right in front. There's a Bible right in front of you. Please open up with you. I want you guys to read with me. Because it's so important. We're teaching the middle schoolers that during the loft. I know Billy's diving deep into that with them in their uh, Sunday school time as well. Is that going through the Bible and learning these things. Please open with and follow their example. Because the middle schoolers are on top of it. Get it, kids. I love that. But read with me verses 10 through 12 here. You see, two men went up into the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and, one, and the other a tax collector. And the Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give tithes of all that I get. Here we find a Pharisee in his prayer. This is something that I find really funny. Whenever you see this Pharisee, he's walking into the temple, and they, they actually describe his posture. Have you noticed that? He walked in, he's standing in the temple. We, we pray a lot here, kind of bowed down. We have like the specific posture that we take, right? At the time of the Pharisees, when they walk into the temple to pray, it'd be a standing presentation. And they'd be looking up to the Father. Because whenever you talk to me, I'd rather you look at me in the eye. You know, same kind of mentality. I'm going to give you the respect. I'm going to look to you and speak to you. And he begins to do what he's been taught very well in the temple, following the rituals to the letter here. Because he says, I thank God. He gives thanksgiving. But if you read his prayer, there's something off here, isn't there? Something really off here. Because he says, God, I thank you that I'm... Not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. Why did he have to say the tax collector's name three times? Extortioners, unjust, tax collector. So I thank God that I'm nothing like them. He looks at him and goes, God, I, I, I am righteous. Thank God that I'm nothing like you. That's what he's praying with the man standing on the other side of the room. Now, you know, like the Pharisees when they're in the temple, they're, they're not very quiet people. So he's being very bolsterous about this. Thank God I'm nothing like him. That's what he's praying. And he goes on to say, look at what I do. I fast twice a week, which is actually, you see, the thing is, when we take that into perspective, that the Jewish law uh, recommended or required us to fast at least one time a year. And he does it twice a week. Over a hundred times more than what he should be doing. And he's saying, look at what I do. I fast twice a week. And I give tithes to all I get. Praise God, he's a good Baptist. <laughs> look at me. Look at what I'm doing. That's what the Pharisees crying out. Look at what I've done. My actions justify me. I'm righteous because of the things that I do. You see church too often times we find Christians that fall into this category. That say, hey, God, look at me. I am righteous. I am wonderful. And the thing is, is he's sitting here being bolsterous, showing himself before the temple. And to all the people in the room, look at me. Look at who I am. Look at me. You see, whenever we come to church, there's three reasons why we show up. I think I've said this once before. We're going to talk a little bit more about this when it comes to January as we start off into this. So we're going to go through Thanksgiving. We have two sermons on Thanksgiving. Then we're going to go into the Advent season. And then come January, we're going to talk about the mission and vision for 2024, what we're guiding for and what we're really aiming towards and what the Lord's really kind of been leading us to. And I'm really excited about that. So we're going to talk about this a little bit more in depth come January. But there's three reasons why we come to church. Is it me time? Is it show time or is it his time? 
Is it me time, his time, my, me time, show time, or his time? Do I walk in here for people to see me? Why'd you show up this morning? Why'd you come here to church this morning? Are you here for everybody to see you so that no one gossips about you? You know, some of you speak in tongues, but you gossip in English. <laughs> that, that's been a constant thing without the church is, you know, we have to be careful what we say and what we do. But are you here to kind of bolster yourself? Are you here to show off? Are you here that way you can look around and go, hey, who's not here today? Are you taking attendance? Thank you if you give us the numbers. I appreciate it. That's what we got Jarrett for. But are you taking attendance? Are you trying to see who's not here this morning? Are you here so people see you? To see how high and mighty you're being? Are you here for you? Is that why you showed up? Are you here for the show? Are you here to be entertained? Are you here to see a wonderful and gorgeous pastor get up here and talk often? <laughs> Is that the whole reason why you showed up? Is that to be entertained? Is that the whole reason why you're here? Are you here for him? The one worthy of our praise, the one who is here to actually receive it. Because guys, the thing is, praise and worship has nothing to do with us. To God be the glory, not to me. We get into this mode of what are we here for? Because here the Pharisee is in this temple, not for God, not for the show, but for everybody to see him. And see, the thing is, there's been books written on this attitude. There's people looking to us and saying, is that us? And church, that's the challenge today. Is that you? Are you here just to be beaten on your chest? Look at me. Look at the wonderful things I've done. Look at how nicely dressed I am. Look at my, guys, I spent a lot of money on this shirt. Is that why you're here? No? Have you guys noticed I wear new balances because I'm cheap? So that's why. <laughs> But the Pharisee walks into the temple looking, saying, look at me. Look at me. You see, we get so caught up in this inward focus mentality. I talked about there's a word for sin that literally, as translated from the Greek, says look upon one's navel. And I can never remember the word for Greek. I always reference it and go, I should probably look that up again because it's in my office. But it means to look upon one's navel. Our natural instinct is to be so egocentric, to be narcissistic in everything, to look towards ourselves first. But if Christ looks towards himself first and said, hey, Lord, look at me, he wouldn't have wind up on the cross. Christ looked outwardly and said, hey, I'm here for you. It was more of a self-sacrifice and anything like that. God humbled himself greatly to come down from glory, to be born like a baby that we're going to celebrate here in the coming months as the season comes to Thanksgiving first. I have a whole thing. But he humbled himself greatly to come and die for us. And here are we standing boasting, look at me. Look at what I've done. Look at the great things that I do. But we're offered a second person in this story. It's the tax collector. Verses 13 and 14, if you'd like to read with me. The tax collector. And it reads this. But the tax collector is standing far off. He wasn't at the front. He wasn't where the Pharisee was. He was standing afar off, probably in the back row, like every good Baptist really is. It would not even lift his eyes up to the heavens. But beat his chest or breast, saying, God, be, more, be merciful to me, a sinner. Here's this man, broken and defeated, set in the back of the church, not even willing to look up. His posture is completely different than the Pharisees because he realizes that he's not even worthy to look upon the Lord. And he's striking his chest repeatedly, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. It almost as if he's trying to punish himself by hitting himself in the chest. That way the Lord doesn't feel like he has to. This man is so, so placed in a, a, a man, mindset that it's not just to be humble, but he's humiliating himself before the Lord. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. 
And look at what the next passage says. And I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. This man who sat in the temple, understanding his place as worthless, as somebody who is defeated, as one who is caught up in sin, knowing that he is not greater than anyone. In fact, that he's the lowest of the low, that he is literally a dog according to, compared to everybody else, and this is what the Pharisees call him. And here he has a, a, a churchgoer, a temple goer, the one who is supposed to be the righteous one, set it up front, mocking him in the back. Saying, thank God I'm nothing like that guy. But that I fast twice a week and tithe. And it doesn't faze him. Because he's like, you, you know what his mentality was? The tax collector's mentality was? Was well, he's right. God have mercy on me. Lord, don't give me what I justly deserve. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Church forgiveness is found through humili humility, not through arrogance. Because that's what it said in the next passage, that this man went to this house justified. That word justified is one of our big like, theological terms that we like to use. We call it salvation or saved. It's, also, it's, a, it's a financial term. I love that because whenever you look at this concept of the sin debt that we owed, to be justified means that your books are made right. That the debt is no longer there, it has been made clean, that you are zeroed out, you're good to go. You don't owe nobody nothing. And God said, this man who begs, God have mercy on me, was justified more than the man who was up in the front of the thing going, God, look at what I've done. Church, we need to go back to a place of humility. We need to go back as a big C church. Go back to a place of humility, looking at God, go, God, we didn't deserve what you did. We didn't deserve that God died on a cross for us. We did not earn that. There's nothing we could do to earn God's love. That's why it's grateful that it's unconditional, that it's not based on what I do, but based on what he has done. It's based on the fact that he wants to have a relationship with me. That God died for me long before I existed, but he knew I was coming. Now, while we were yet sinners... Christ died for us. Church, when we can go back to a life of humility and realize that we're not high and mighty, when we realize that we're not the best thing in the world, but we know the best thing in the world, that we know exactly that we're just like you. That there's no way I can come up here and beat on my chest and say, hey, look at me, I'm so amazing, because I'm just like you. You know, we all have a testimony, which is, is a Christian way of saying, hey, we all done some stuff. And kids, let me tell you this, a good testimony, if I can give you this in my middle school or wherever you guys are at, a good testimony is, a, is, hey, I was a church kid my entire life. Let us pay your stupid tax. Learn from our mistakes. Because I'd rather me have gone through it and tell you, hey, this, this is going to be the outcome than you guys go through the pain that we've gone through already. But when we stop and look and go, hey, I'm, I'm no better than the person next to me. That I am not more righteous. That I am only found righteous by the blood of the Lamb. Because he died on the cross to save me. And that's what justifies me. And guess what? You could have the same salvation. That Jesus Christ actually died on the cross, not just for Pastor Wayne, not just for Pastor Billy, not just for Chad and Wendy, not just for some of you in the crowd, but he died for every single one of us. That way we can come to know him. And that way our sins can be paid for and left. And all it takes is us to have a belief in him that we shall not perish but have everlasting life, as John 3.16 calls us. Because God sends his son not into this world to condemn it, but that through him it might be saved, John 3.17. That salvation is offered to all of us. And that we can be made righteous. righteous or as the, the passage says, we can be justified by our actions. 
But church, those of us who are saved, those of us who are born again, we need to walk down this path called sanctification. It's a growth into to look more and more like Jesus every day. It's to be a disciple. And the first step of being a good disciple is realizing that you're not better than anyone. The first step for being a disciple is to fall back on your knees. I said this morning, even. If you, if, when's the last time you, pray, you prayed, God put me on my knees again? God put me back on my knees for me to pray. For me to pray. I prayed that one time. I'm going to tell you this. It's not fun. Because I prayed that and I took a step out, tripped, landed on my face. God put me back, my, put me back on my knees the hard way. Because he knew, knew that was what I needed. He knew that's the only way he was going to get me down there because that's a long way down. <laughs> but sure enough, I got there. But when's the last time God put me back, you prayed God put me back on my knees. When's the last time you said God humiliate me? God humiliate me. God humble me. Because guess what? Those words had the same root word. God, to be humble, to not be pious, not to be righteous, not to feel myself higher than everyone else, but God put me below everyone. Lord, humble me as you humbled yourself. This church, if you don't know Jesus, this is exactly what he did for you. He humbled himself for you. He died on the cross for you. He died a thief's death for you. And he didn't earn it, didn't deserve it, but he died for you. And so church, I'm going to go ahead and do this. Worship team, you guys would go ahead and come on up. Church, if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, I'd love to share him with you. I'd love to show you what it means to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. I'd love to show you what the Bible says it means to be or what it takes to be justified. And let me tell you, the tax collector's prayer, the words didn't mean it was the belief in his heart that really set him right. Because words are just words, but it's the belief behind the words, the actions behind the words that matter. And his belief, God have mercy, mercy on me, a sinner. His faith that God would actually show mercy is what justified him. In church this morning, if you're sitting here and you're like, Pastor, I'll be honest with you. I'm the one who's been up in the front of the temple beating on my chest, crying out, God, look at me and look at what I've done. Let me, let me show you the miraculous thing that I am. And you're like, God I, I, God, I need to repent of that. God, I need to put that away. Would you guys come and pray and repent? God, I, I, I need to be forgiven because I've been the thing that stood between you and your people because I thought myself righteous on my own accounts. But Lord, I know it's because of you that I am made righteous. And praise God for that. If that's you this morning, you want to come pray, please do. I'm going to have some deacons and deaconesses up here and we're all going to be willing to pray with you. And I love that. Pastor Billy wants to come forward and we're going to pray with you and that's what we want to be about. This comes to the Lord with repentance because we know what it's like to be humbled. We know what it means to look at God. God, it's not because of me, but because of everything with you. And we'd love to show that to you and share with you and pray with you on that. If you're sitting here this morning and you're like, Pastor, I heard your message, but right now I'm burdened with something else. Right now I've been just tore apart. God's been working in me or I just know, I, God, I need to come to you. I need to pray for a certain situation going on in my life. My family needs healing. Lord, I need healing. God, I need to repent of something else. Lord, I just need you to move. I don't know how, but Lord, I need you to move greatly in my life. If you don't mind, come forward. We'd love to pray with you. That's what we're here for. Because if you walk out of this door the same way you came in, you gave up an opportunity. You gave up a reason to come forward. And let me tell you this, in this church, one thing that we've come to know, and I know I asked them to come up here, and I'm still going. Don't worry, we still got like another hour and a half. We're fine. One thing I know about this church, something I find very great about Chiron First Baptist, is that we're not here to judge who walks up the altar, walks up to the altar. 
We're not here to look at you and say, hey, look at where they're going. Ha ha, I wonder what they're dealing with. No, their heart is behind you. Everyone next to you is looking like, okay, while they're going up there to pray, I'm going to either walk with them or I'm going to pray for them right here. Because we know God's doing something and we want to see it happen. So church, if you don't mind standing with me this morning. The altar's open. Come use it, come use it well. Use it righteously. Lord, Lord, we need you. Lord, I need you. Lord, I want to come to you. Come on.